Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful people. Today, we are going to witness an empire in crisis. We are going to look at the caste system in colonial Spanish America. We will look at how the empire attempted to reorganize itself, to fix itself in the 1700s. And then we will look at Spain and the French Revolution, which is going to have giant, giant consequences for the colonies in the New World, the Spanish colonies in the New World. So before we delve into the New World, we um, have already seen how hundreds of thousands of, 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 of Spanish have moved to the colonies. Um, we've seen the uh, establishment of giant haciendas, giant estates, thousands of acres given out to Spanish noblemen, um, as well as the church. These haciendas and the ecomiendas are the lifeblood of, 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 of New Spain and the other Spanish colonies in the New World. Dominating the landscape and you can see them today the ruined reminders of, of yesteryear two institutions will rule in the spanish colonies the spanish elites the spanish elites the land-owning elites and the roman catholic clergy that the spanish crown has a dominion over in the new world which is unheard of back in Europe, ruling over the vast majority of landless native peasants. But before we get deeper into that, and that's what I was trying to say earlier, we have to go back to Europe very briefly, but we have to go back to Europe. And this is all interconnected. Remember, it was the Europeans that um, created uh, these new nations in the new world. And so to understand uh, the English colonies, we have to go back to England. To understand the Spanish colonies, we have to at least go back to Europe and Spain. Now, in Europe, by the 1800s, the nobility, the aristocracy, the 1% of European, uh, the titled classes, were referring to themselves as blue bloods. I'm sure you've heard blue blood. Uh, that word, that, that term means of noble blood. If you are a, a blue-blooded individual, you have noble blood. And they very proudly called themselves blue bloods. Um, they did in the 1800s, the 1900s, uh, and they do today. They do today. But actually, there's one, there's one theory that that term blue blood actually began in Spain in the 900s, um, Sangre Azul, Sangre Azul. It begins in Spain in the 900s during the Reconquista. During the Reconquista, blue blood. Why Why do nobles have blue blood? What, what, why, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, according to lore, um, but there is evidence for this. Spanish knights during the Reconquista, when they would uh, meet each other, um, they would lift their arm. They would lift their arm up to show their wrist, to show that their wrist had blue blood. Now, according to lore, this is to show that they are of Visigoth descent. They are of Germanic descent. So light is their skin tone that they show blue, that they show blue. The Visigoths were a Germanic barbarian tribe that conquers Spain in the 400s during the collapse of the Roman Empire. It was the Visigoths who established the nobility of Spain. It was the Visigoths who had uh, several kingdoms before the arrival of Muslims from North Africa. This will all be torn asunder with the arrival of the Moors with the Islamic invasion of 711. However, to distinguish themselves, to show they have no North African blood, no Berber blood, no Moorish blood, no Arabic blood, they would show their wrists to each other to show, again, their Visigoth pedigree. Now, in reality, if you go to North Africa, these are the uh, uh, descendants of the Moors. Uh, they're not. 
that much darker than uh, many Spaniards today. Um, I think it has a lot more to do um, with the nobles having blue veins is the fact that they weren't working in the sun. This is why the nobility could show their veins. Um, if you work all day in the sun, you get a tan. Obviously, the more tan your skin, the darker your skin, the less likely there is for veins to show. And so the nobility of Europe was fair skinned, uh, not because of their lineage to Germanic barbarians, but because of their uh, aversion to being outside. They don't work in the fields all day like the peasantry. And so this association with light skin and the nobility uh, develops during this time. Um, not just in Europe, not just in Europe, uh, in many parts of the world. And again, you can see here, this is a Native American who, after just a couple of years of attending an American uh, Indian boarding school, look how much lighter his skin tone has become. Uh, in this country, in the United States, uh, the term redneck, that is for what, a working class uh, a, a white American redneck, well, that's because he works in the sun. He has a red neck. He's a blue collar worker. Um, and there's a negative connotation with that, right? Um, it's the same thing. You work in the sun, your skin darkens, or your neck gets red if you are of English descent because you can't get a tan. You just go red. You have two modes, white and red. Um, this is how that, 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 that connection, that correlation between class and skin color develops. It's very interesting. Same in China, light skin was very much, very much sought after by the nobility because it was associated with being noble. And it remains today in Chinese culture, a great many, not all, I'm not speaking in absolutes by any means, but a great many Chinese go through tremendous measures to prevent any sort of tanning of the skin. Um, China, Japan is very, very similar. India, same thing. This association with, with lighter skin and the nobility. Um, and it leaves a cultural imprint. India leads all nations in skin lightening cream. Now, there's a lot of other reasons for this. I'm not saying uh, this is the only explanation, but it's one of many explanations and a very interesting one. India, Indonesia, China, oh, but also Colombia and Mexico lead the way in skin lightening creams. If you go to Australia, Germany, France, everyone's trying to get darker. But in those countries, they're trying to get lighter, um, including uh, uh, Japan, the Middle East. There's that connection, that connotation between light skin and the nobility, between the upper class and the peasantry. But we have, during the Reconquista, Blue Blood Nights, proving their purity of blood. This continues. This obsession with blood will continue among the Spanish nobility, which brings us to limpieza de sangre. Limpieza de sangre. Um, literally translates to, and many of you guys uh, speak Spanish, I'm sure, cleanliness of blood or blood purity. This becomes an obsession of Spain's. And to understand race and society in the Spanish colonies, um, we have to understand race and society when it comes to uh, Spain itself, because they're going to take these concepts of blood purity and your place within society with them to the new world. Purity of blood, purity of blood, cleanliness of blood. Well, this really kicks off during or after, pardon me, the fall of Granada in 1492, when Spain unites a Christian kingdom. Background. It all goes back to the Alhambra Decree of 1492. You may remember that all Jews and Muslims were forced to convert to Christianity or leave. You are given a very clear choice. Uh, in a nation of about six and a half million, that was Spain during this time, about 200,000 Jews remain. Uh, they come to be called conversos. They convert to Christianity to remain. Um, as many as a million Muslims remain. They are known as moriscos. 
moriscos comes most likely from the word more moriscos they remain now in the end between 1609 and 1614 uh the spanish crown systematically expels uh all the moriscos to varying success they get frustrated and they just kick the moriscos out for the most part um, between 275,000 and 300 Moriscos were expelled. Many will remain. Many will remain. That being said, suspicions remained. Many Spaniards believed that these new Christians, that's what they were called, new Christians, were false converts practicing their religion in secret. They were crypto Jews. They were crypto Muslims. And with time, with time, this concept of blood purity becomes more focused on race than religion. It doesn't, after a while, it doesn't matter if you are a full convert. If your parents had been full converts, the suspicion remains. And you begin to be looked at with suspicion. And it affects your place within Spanish society. Here is the expulsion of the Jews in 1492, captured in art. Forced to flee, forced to flee um, Muslims and Jews who refused to convert. Again, they would look in your window to make sure you weren't lighting a Sabbath candle on Friday evening. And we remember, just have a little bit, just a taste. Again, this is a way to prevent a crypto Jew or a crypto Muslim um, being an associate of yours. We saw that before. Restrictions. Restrictions. Now, these are for converts. These aren't for crypto Jews and crypto Muslims. These, even if you, all of your heart is with uh, the Christian faith, even if your parents were Christians, there are restrictions on you if you are a new Christian, if you are a converso, if you are a convert. Even if it's several generations away, um, those restrictions remain. Now it's about blood. It's not about your faith. It is about blood. Many religious and military orders don't allow converts or the descendants of converts. Remember, it could be your grandparent, your great-grandparent. Guilds and other organizations demanded in their bylaws that you had to provide proof of so-called cleanliness of blood. You would have to provide grandparents and even great-grandparents baptismal records to prove that, no, I am 100% Christian Spanish. There's no Jewish blood or Muslim blood in my family. That doesn't mean that upwardly mobile new Christians didn't get false documents. They did. They did. There was a, a very healthy business in getting false documents to prove your Christian pedigree. But if you didn't do that, you would have to live with these restrictions. You would have to live with these restrictions. Um, So-called impure bloods. I don't know what else to call them. Uh, new Christians. Um, again, it could be your grandparent, your great grandparent. You were prevented from government jobs. Any government job you were not allowed to get in Spain. You were barred from the military. You were barred from the military as a new Christian. You were barred from university if you had Jewish or Muslim blood. Uh, you were also banned from even going to the new world, period. You were not allowed to go to the colonies. Again, people got fake documents. I'm not saying it didn't happen. It certainly happened. But on paper, you were not even allowed to go to the colonies. You were also barred from joining the clergy in Spain. This is all in Spain. In varying degrees, this obsession with blood and bloodlines will be in Spain well into the 1800s. Still in 1860, blood purity was a requirement for admission to the military academy. It wasn't until 1865 that the requirement to prove your pedigree, to prove that you are not a new Christian at all, um, was lifted from the army and navy. In 1870, it was finally lifted that you were barred from government jobs. 1870, finally that blood purity rule was lifted. Um, it wasn't until 1946 that the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, the um, that, 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 that priesthood within the Catholic Church, lifted the ban. The effect, 
the effect, the Spanish and the Portuguese, we're not looking at the Portuguese, uh, they will bring this concept of blood purity to their empires. However, the other, the, 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 the other in the room is going to stop being those with Muslim blood or Jewish blood and move to native blood or black African blood in the new world that's going to transfer. It's not going to be about who is a new Christian. It's going to be about who doesn't have Spanish blood, the natives and the black Africans. They're going to take this obsession with purity of blood to their empires. Race and society in colonial Spanish America. Society in Spanish America, like Spain, was very much based on your racial descent. There was a strict racial hierarchy, and the more so-called pure you were, the higher you were within society. Now, that is not to say that Anglo-America, British America, did not have an obsession with race. They did. They had laws on the books restricting uh, those without English blood, certainly. But in Anglo-America, in the 13 colonies, it was much more simple. It was much more simple. You had three primary races. You had white, you had black, and you had Native American. For the most part, the English brought with them their women folk. And so we don't see the tremendous blending of, 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 of races in Anglo America the way that we do in Spanish America. And it gets very complicated, incredibly complicated, ridiculously complicated in the Spanish colonies. Three? My God, no way. Which brings us to the casta system in colonial Spanish America, the caste system. That's all that is. Um, and casta means lineage, breed, race. Within the Spanish Empire and the Portuguese, the system of castas was much more than simply social racial classification. It impacted every aspect of your life including economics, uh, taxation. Both the Spanish colonial state and the church in the colonies expected more tax and tribute payments from those of lower socio-racial categories. You paid more taxes the less Spanish you were. Your status and your economic place within the empire also was reflected through your race or vice versa pardon me your race would greatly influence not always there's exceptions would very much affect your socioeconomic status within the empire um in short the wider someone was the higher their status was within the uh, colonies um over the, the 1600s over the 1600s, long lists of different terms used to identify types of people with specific racial or ethnic heritages were developed. By 1821, by 1821, there are more than 100 variations, more than 100 variations. And it differed from region to region on top of that. Incredibly, incredibly confusing. Now, today we're going to examine the seven primary groups. There are just know there are hundreds of others. There are hundreds of others. We're going to start at the top and then work our way down. Um, these are the castes within Spanish American society. These are just the big ones. These are just the big ones. So many variations, so many terms. But what you need to know is um, your blood decided a tremendous amount during this time. This is a very complex 
breakdown of what happens when one group from one group uh, 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 breeds with another group and their offspring. It's it's it gets incredibly complicated. Uh, you can freeze this and look at it. It gets in. It's not simple. Let's just put it that way. It is very much anything but simple. If one group goes with another group, it creates a new group. It doesn't fall into another group. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. We're just going to look at the big ones. We're just going to look at the big ones to help better understand Spanish colonial society. And luckily for us, during the uh, Enlightenment, the Spanish and members of the colonies become obsessed with these castes, and they paint these castes. Uh, with the different categories. So there's some really cool paintings of this time from the 1700s of these different cast members. Let's first look at the top. Let's first look at the top. Espanolas, right? The Spanish, the Spanish. Uh, they were people of Spanish descent or other European descent that had settled in South or Central America. Um, both immigrant and American-born Spaniards generally shared the same rights and privileges. However, these guys are further divided into two groups. The Spanish, the Espanoles, are divided into two broad groups. And these are very proud people. They often will have their... These are the elites. These are the elites of the Spanish uh, colonies. They will have their... Um, they will have their uh, familial coat of arms in their portraits, incredibly proud of their titles, of their heritage. We have a lot more of their paintings, of course, because they had money to pay for painters. Okay. The top of the food chain when it comes to Spanish societies were the peninsulares. These are Spaniards and other white immigrants born in Europe. The first group of peninsulares uh, were those appointed to important jobs in the government or the Catholic Church. They're born in Europe, but they're appointed to jobs in the colonies. Um, this was done on purpose. You didn't want native-born Spaniards taking these government or clergy positions because you don't want anyone to have a power base. You want someone who is unfamiliar with the land. They don't have political alliances in this new world. So you pick them in Spain and you send them to the new world. That way they are completely reliant on the crown and the government for their power. You don't want native born Spaniards in the colonies in these high government positions because then you might have a threat. Then you might have a, 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 a political threat. They might decide to just declare independence and many people might be loyal to them rather than the Spanish crown. So we get these Spaniards from Spain and we send them in for government jobs. And we also keep them moving around the empire frequently. We change their position frequently so they don't get too comfortable within the Spanish empire. The Spanish do this on purpose. The second group, the second group um, come for business opportunities. They come for business opportunities um, or simply as immigrants, simply as immigrants to the peninsula. But these are the top of the food chain, the peninsulares. They are the highest within the highest group. They're the upper hand. Next, we have the criollos, the criollos or creoles. These are Spaniards and other whites born in the Americas. They are Spaniards, but they're not as high as peninsulares. Um, it means native born and raised. These are whites born in this country um, who have unmixed European, mostly usually Spanish ancestry. Both the mother and the father are white Europeans. Now, many second or third generation Criollos have become very, very wealthy because they came early. These are the people that came in that first wave with the, um, the conquistadors. 
They represent the bourgeoisie, the middle class. They are the ones that you'll see in cities. These are white, native-born citizens of the empire. And they tended to be appointed to lower-level government jobs. Um, however, by the early 1600s, you do find Criollos in higher positions within the government, usually through bribery. You can kind of jump out of that middle management role. These are Criollos, white, native-born Spaniards. The middle class, the merchant class. They don't have titles, but a lot of them have a lot of money. This man is from the Criollo social caste, uh, but he is very powerful and very wealthy and has for himself a title. Next in our levels, the second group. So we have the Spanish. Now we have the Mestizos, the Mestizos, um, which means mixed. That is native Indian and white, native Indian and white. This was the first of these many ethnic groups to be created in the new world. Hernan Cortez most likely had a child with his interpreter. So from the beginning, the Spanish are mixing with the native population. In the second half of the 1600s, mestizos begin appearing in larger and larger numbers in the official census. Um, because many of these children were born out of wedlock, there was a an association of illegitimacy when it comes to mestizo, but by no means were all illegitimate. Uh, but that was a, 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 a stigma attached to, to mestizos. Furthermore, if you were a mestizo, you did not have to um, work in the acomienda system. So many natives purposely bred with Europeans so that their children would not be forced into pretty much slavery uh, within the Ecomienda system. So there was a, a systematic and purposeful uh, breeding with Europeans so that you didn't have to see your children suffer the way that you had suffered within the Ecomienda system. Now, most mestizos were the peasants and working people in towns and cities. In the countryside, you found the natives and slaves, but in the cities, mestizos uh, were um, the, 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 the lower level workers. In time, the mestizos will become the largest ethnic group in many parts of the empire, uh, like Mexico. By 1800, a third of the empire were mestizo. Now, to make things even more confusing, we've got mestizo, right? We understand it's a Spaniard and a native Indian. It gets more complicated. It gets more complicated. I love these paintings, though. It shows the, the blending in uh, this part of the world at this time. Some fantastic paintings. And if you travel through Latin America, uh, you'll see this blending to this day, right? Okay, to make things more complicated for you beautiful people, we have a subset of the mestizo, and that is the cas the castizo, the castizo. That is white with some native, white with some native. A castizo were people with one mestizo parent and one Spanish parent. So you have some native blood. Um this is a subset. They are the higher levels of mestizo within Spanish society. They are the higher, the higher tier of mestizo. When you have a, a Spaniard and a, 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 a someone with some native blood, um, you can even create another Spaniard. You can either create, if it's a small amount of, 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 of native blood, if a castizo breeds with a Spaniard, you can create a Spaniard. It cancels it out 
All right. I, if you're looking at me like, well, what are you talking about? This is insanity. It's 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 very complex. It's very interesting, though, uh, but somewhat confusing. OK, the other group, the lower group, Cholos. Orale, we. No, not those cholos. Different. Cholo uh, is an old Spanish term for uh, a, a mixed breed dog. It's an insult. The term cholo and coyote were used interchangeably for this other group. <coughs> that is a Native American with some white blood. It's the reverse of the castizo. Um, cholo was uh it, it's pejorative it, it's not a nice thing to call someone at this time but this is another subset and again coyote and cholo are used interchangeably so you have a, a native with some white blood this is uh the lower group of the mestizo class and again how you are in society is determined uh, uh what your bloodline is Number three, number three are the pardos. Now, this is a tri-racial citizen of the empire. You have white, African, and uh, native blood. White, African, and native blood. They were on the usually on the lower ends of the socioeconomic status. Um, usually. There are exceptions. There are some wealthy pardos as well. But we are getting lower. Number three. So Spanish, mixed, and the pardo, the triracial. And a lot of this happens because the Spanish crown doesn't like to send Spanish women to the new world because they want, they don't want your families there. They don't want private property. They don't want a challenge to this gold mine, which is a Latin American gold and silver mine, literally a gold mine, whereas the English don't have gold or silver, and so they need to make a profit, so they send their women folk. They'll send, pro the, the British will literally, if you get arrested for being a prostitute in the 1600s, you could find yourself on a bridal boat, as they were called, and they would just ship you to the New World, and a man could buy you for a bag of tobacco. That's the English colonies. The Spanish colonies are quite different. Okay, farther down the line, you have the natives, the Indios. Now, they were given limited rights, and their treatment does improve uh, after the middle 1500s with demands of reform from the Catholic Church and the introduction of African slavery. Life for the Indians does improve. However, they are still very low on the socioeconomic level. They are still facing abuse from um, local elites. Um, some, interestingly enough, of the elites of the Inca, the Aztec, and the Maya, very early on, some of the elites marry the Spanish and Marriott, they joined the aristocracy of the Spanish. That is uh, uh, very early on. These guys are usually peasants. Um, that being said, they can belong to uh, uh, many, any economic class. And you do find incidences of Indios uh, accumulating a tremendous amount of wealth. It's rare, but we certainly, certainly find it. Um, and you will find the natives, um, on the Ecomienda and Hacienda systems. They are they play a pivotal role in those two systems. Next, we have mulatos, and that is African and white, Black African and white European. Persons of the first generation of a Spanish and Black ancestry. Now, if you're born into slavery, you're a slave. That's if your mother was a slave. If your mother was a slave, um, you automatically become a slave within the colonial empire. However, if your father was a slave, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that will be your, um, your future. And there were a lot of free black uh, 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 members of the Spanish empire, whether through buying their own freedom or manumission, the freeing of slaves by their master. Now, there were cases of the mother being white and the father being black, but that was incredibly rare. It's usually the other way around. They were fathered down on the socioeconomic 
uh, this scene would have been very, very rare. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but it was very, very rare. Uh, mulatto is white and black mixed. We, we've had that term in the English language as well, though it's not used anymore. As you go down the socioeconomic levels, you'll notice that the artists show a lot more abuse, a lot more mischief, and that speaks to their own prejudice of the time, right? The working classes uh, behave much worse than the upper classes. Uh, this is, uh, 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 I suppose, a form of propaganda, right? But something happened. Something happened between these two. This kid's about to shoot a uh, some kind of ball at somebody. As you go down, you, you they show more fighting. Zambos. Zambos, mixed black and native. Mixed black and native were Zambo. Um, again, farther down on the social economic level. Native, black African. I love these paintings though. At the lowest within the Spanish Empire were the Negros, the Negros, Black Africans. Um, these were people of full sub-Saharan African descent. Um, first generation almost always were slaves, although you did see free Black communities within the, um, within the uh, empire. Um, their low social status was legally enforced. Their social status was legally enforced in force. Uh, they were prohibited by law from many positions, including entering the priesthood. Their testimony in court was valued less than others. By 1800, by 1800, Spanish America was about a third mestizo, a third native, and a sizable uh, a group of uh, Creoles as well. That is the Spanish Empire by 1800. I just gave you a taste. I just gave you a taste. It gets so much more complicated. Um, but I won't, I won't, I won't make you suffer. Uh, black colonists were used for hard labor um, and the lower paid jobs. There were exceptions. Again, I'm not speaking in absolutes, but generally. Okay, reorganization of the empire. By the 1700s, Spain was ruled by the Bourbons, that same family, a different wing of the French royal family. Just to make things extra complicated for you guys, the Bourbons are in power. Um, they ended the Habsburg rule uh, in the uh, Spanish War of Succession. I'm not going to get too deep into that. Don't worry. But the Habsburgs ruled Spain. Now the Bourbons, the same family that ruled France in the 1700s. Following its defeat in the Seven Years' War against Great Britain, which ended in 1763, Spain lost Florida to Great Britain, but won the Louisiana Territory uh, from France with the Treaty of Fontainebleau. So she lost Florida, but it gets back the, uh, or it gets the uh, Louisiana Territory. But Spain in the 1700s is not where she was before. Um, it is not the superpower that it once was. It still controls a giant, vast empire, but it is not the Spain of the 15 or 1600s. Please keep that in mind. That being said, as far as land mass goes, very, very impressive. Although this map is a little bit misleading. Um, I guess I'm jumping the gun at 1790. It does get Florida back, but for the time being, it loses Florida to the British after the Seven Years' War. Reforms. Charles III, a Bourbon, a Bourbon, um, tries to make his empire healthy again. These are known as the Bourbon reforms. Over the 1760s, he sets about trying to reorganize the empire. Now, this is very difficult to do. The British are going to try the same thing in the 1760s with the 13 colonies. That doesn't go well either because these 
empires, these colonies have been around for hundreds of years by the 1700s, or at least a couple of hundreds of years. It's hard to reform societies that are set in their ways. But he tries. He tries. Um, first thing he does under these reforms, number one, is he abolishes the monopolies of the Spanish empire and allows other Spanish commercial centers to trade within the empire. Up until this point, everything went through Spain. If you wanted to ship something from Mexico to modern day Colombia, it had to go to Spain and then go back to Colombia. It's mercantile. Remember, they want absolute control. He weakens that up a little bit. He allows for more trade between the empire. So he's breaking down the monopolies. He's allowing more trade within the empire. And he sought to make tax collection more efficient and to stop the rampant corruption and smuggling that was going on within the Spanish empire in the 1760s. So Charles III tries to reform. Here is an image. This is so Spanish. Here is seated below the Virgin Mary is King Charles III and the Pope. These are the two powers within the empire, the church and the crown. And they are, are right alongside each other, blessed by the Virgin Mother. Very, very Spanish. It's very representative of the Spanish empire of the 1700s. Let's take a quick look. Let's look at, this is a trade map. Um, people with a lot of time on their hands make these. This is a trade map showing the Spanish Empire in the 1700s. Notice everything goes back and forth, back and forth, back to Spain, back to the colonies, back to Spain, back to the colonies. Compare this with the British Empire at the same time. You see how the British Empire, if you want to trade between Massachusetts and uh, Jamaica, of course you can. If you want to trade between uh, Barbados and, 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 and South Carolina, you don't have to go through London, but the Spanish Empire, it's mercantile, strictly regulated. Everything needs to go through Spain. Spain wants to wet its beak in all business transactions. They want taxes and they want control. Even as compared to the Dutch trade routes, here you can see in green, the middle to the right, they have much more open trade. The Spanish don't believe in open free trade like the British, like the Dutch. This is a government obsessed with control over the economy. Intendants. Intendants. Intendants were government officials appointed to oversee all of these reforms. They're bureaucrats. They're royal bureaucrats. The crown appoints intendants back in Spain and sends them to the new world to oversee these reforms. This is a French form of doing things that the Bourbons bring to Spain from France. Um, each intendant was given a region um, and administered to administer to, pardon me. They have districts within the empire that they oversee and they are uh their two jobs is to collect taxes and to prevent corruption and smuggling this is their job this is their job this is an attempt this is an attempt to clean up the spanish empire soon many peninsulares are pouring into the empire for these jobs more and more spanish merchants spanish-born peninsulares or pouring in to the colonies for business opportunities. This creates tension between the Criollos, the white natives, and these peninsulares that are pouring in to the colonies. That being said, that being said, these reforms do work to a degree, to a degree. A smuggling is cut down, corruption is cut down, it never goes away. But he, the Bourbon reforms, don't think of them as failures, um, but it, it was too little too late in many respects. Rising tensions, rising tensions. Criollo elites, now these are native-born whites with money, members of the merchant class, increasingly are resentful over Spain's interference with 
regional or local affairs. They have some major issues with the Spanish government, with the Spanish crown. One, they want to make trade more freely available within Latin America, within the empire. We want open trade within the empire. We want to be more like the British colonies. They also fear that these new imperial regulations are going to increase. They're going to lose autonomy. There are more soldiers being stationed in Latin America. There's more interference in local affairs. They fear that this is the beginning of even more interference. They also deeply resent, the Criollos deeply resent Spanish policies favoring peninsulares. They resent that they get all the good jobs. They resent that they are at the top of the army, the church, government, etc. Now, by the late 1700s, there are models that are influencing Criollo's critiques of the Spanish crown. Now, the world is a much bigger place in the 1700s, but they are well aware that colonists, members of the merchant class, have successfully cast off a colonial overlord through a war of independence and established their own free republic. They know about the American War of Independence, made up of mostly merchant class. And the biggest gripe of these British colonists in North America was government interference of their everyday lives and business transactions. They see that. In fact, the Spanish served with the colonists against the British in the American War of Independence. The Spanish were there. They helped the Americans right alongside the French helping the Americans. It was during the American War of Independence that Spain regains Florida. This is before the American War of Independence on the left. This is the American War of Independence in the aftermath. They won back Spain. They see it. They see it. They know that it's possible. They, they, they see it as a model, but that's not the inspiration we're going for. This will be a greater inspiration. The French Revolution is going to flan, fan the flames of language. It's unreasonable to be ruled by a power thousands of miles away. It's unreasonable. Ah, the Enlightenment is back to give jobs to people just because they're born in Spain. That's irrational. What we need is a rational, scientific government. The French Revolution is going to fan the discourse, the language, the conversation in the late 1700s. Spain and the French Revolution. Spain and the French Revolution. Spain is now ruled by Charles IV. It's now ruled by Charles IV. Um, he is a, 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 a relative to the French king who is currently on trial. Uh, he's weak. He's weak. He's dominated. He's dominated by two people in his life. He's dominated by his uh, chief advisor, Godoy. He listens to everything Godoy says. Godoy is pretty much the ruler of Spain under Charles IV. And he is also um, under the heel of his wife, Maria Luisa of Parma. She is very domineering and controlling. Now, in the beginning, Spain sits on the sidelines of the French Revolution. However, they are fearful that these ideas will, 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 will spread into Spain. And so the king uh, introduces, in the early stages of the French Revolution, he reintroduces the Spanish Inquisition, he introduces repressive policies, and he ends any plans of reform. He shuts down Spain in the early years of the French Revolution, fearing that this virus, liberty, fraternity, equality, will spread right across the Pyrenees. Remember, Spain shares a border with France. In the war of the first coalition, when all of Europe rises up against France, Spain sits on the sidelines. Better to watch Spain kill each other, I mean, uh, Europe kill each other, Spain, let's stay out of this. Let us stay out of this. And then the king is killed. A Bourbon 
king is killed when Louis the Sixteenth meets with the national razor. Well, for Spain, that's too much. That is too much. And so Spain joins the first coalition. They join the first coalition. During its war with France, uh, Spain is desperate for revenue. It increases taxes. It increases uh, control over uh, business, angering the Spanish people. And then disaster comes to Spain when France invades Spain. They cross the Pyrenees, that chain of mountains, and invade Spain. This goes very badly for the Spanish. It goes incredibly badly for the Spanish. This is the so-called War of the Pyrenees. This is a, a sub-war during the French Wars of Revolution. Now, as things continue to go badly for the Spanish fighting against the revolution, Godoy convinces the king to switch sides. The king of Spain switches sides. Now we're on France's side. Sorry, France, we're on your side. You guys are doing really well against us. We are on your side. And so Spain switches sides. Now we're on the French side. Well, the British see this and they surround the island. They surround the island with their ships. The British can do that. They have a very good navy. The Spanish economy falls to ruins and they are cut off from their colonies. Those ships can't go back to Spain because the British are trying to choke Spain. The effects, it's disaster. It's disaster for the Spanish economy. It's disaster for the empire's economy. More and more business is being swallowed up by the British empire. This increases the power of the British empire who move in uh, in many places to do business now that Spain has been cut off. And many of those Criollos, within the empire are more than happy to deal with the British instead of the Spanish. It weakens Spain's dominion over the empire. And then we have this guy, Napoleon. Napoleon is the death nail for the Spanish empire. It's gonna create, he's gonna create a lot of calamities for Spain during his rule over France. Number one, he forces Spain to give them back the Louisiana territory. He forces them to give back to France the Louisiana territory. Spain doesn't have a choice. Napoleon is Napoleon. Spain is Spain. And so Spain loses the Louisiana territory back to France. Again, 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 again. The French and the Spanish meet the British at the southern tip of Spain, right there at Trafalgar. At Trafalgar, uh, this is a terrible, 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 terrible blow to the Spanish uh, uh, Navy. A combined force of French and Spanish ships meet the British at the Battle of Trafalgar, and they lose. They lose a tremendous amount. Uh, close to 4,500 are killed. Uh, 8,000 Spaniards and French are captured. 21 ships are destroyed. Um, it's absolutely terrible for the Spanish. The hero of Trafalgar was uh, Admiral Nelson, Horatio Nelson. Uh, he dies. He dies in this great sea battle. And if you want to celebrate the Battle of Trafalgar, you can go to London. They have Trafalgar Square. And there on the column is Nelson, the hero. See? Again, if, if you get anything out of these uh, lessons, you know where to go when you're in Europe. You know where to celebrate these battles. If you don't want to celebrate the ba Battle of Trafalgar, that's okay. You can go to Waterloo Station in London to celebrate the Battle of Waterloo. You see, you're learning things. You're learning. You're welcome. You're welcome. I know you're thanking me right now. I can feel it. I can feel it. Godoy then makes a ridiculous consent, but he doesn't really have a choice. He allows Napoleon to march through Spain on his way to Portugal. He allows Napoleon to march his troops through Spain to defeat the Portuguese who are allied with British uh, 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 factions. The French, as they march, wreak havoc on Spain. They live off of the land. 
they ransack, they pillage, they steal. This creates tremendous anger among the Spanish population. How could you let these hundreds of thousands of troops march through Spain? They rise up. They rise up. And both Godoy and Charles IV must flee Spain. They leave. Charles goes and lives the rest of his life in Rome. Napoleon, seeing an opportunity, decides in order to make things peaceful, in Spain, I tell you what I'll do, Spain, for you, because I love you, Spain, I will appoint my brother as king. Joseph Bonaparte is installed as the king of Spain. Not very popular among most Spaniards. When Napoleon installs his brother as king, the British invade Spain. This is some of the worst fighting of the Napoleonic Wars. This is bad, hard fighting. We have Spaniards that fight for Napoleon. We have Spaniards that fight for the British. We see peasants rising up, launching guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla means baby war. This is where we get that term. The Spanish peasants, regular people rising up and killing their French occupiers. Spain is in tatters. The economy is ruined. It's being occupied by not just the French, but also the British. The countryside is in ruin and atrocities are being committed. This is terrible for Spain. It's also terrible for Napoleon. He refers to his Spanish war, the Peninsula War, as the Spanish ulcer. As much money and men he puts in to trying to win Spain, he can't. He calls it his Spanish ulcer. Like an ulcer, it burns his stomach. It, it burns his empire. Spain and Russia really is his unraveling. With Spain occupied, surrounded by British ships. This has an effect. This has a giant effect. It allows an independence movement to grow in the colonies. It allows those conversations about what is rational government, what is reasonable government, to even happen. Spain is cut off from her children. And if anyone has had children, or even been a child, you know when your parents leave, you jump on the bed. You eat what you want. This is what happens. It, it, it frees up these colonies to get independence movements going. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen. We are going to see that while Europe is in ruin, Latin America begins to make bold, bold moves. We are going to look at the independence movements of Latin America in our next lesson. Thank you all so, so, so very much uh, until we meet again.